and creative agency, I was like, things like this happen. And it's like, that's what social media is, right? Social media, things can happen, you plan, you record things, and maybe it just doesn't come back right. Maybe somebody responds the way you don't expect them to respond, so how do you handle the situation? Now clearly I could sit down and go in my chair and wait till it's all set up, but I figured I'd warm up the audience until we can get that computer rebooted. And if we can't get the computer rebooted, then I'm just gonna go freestyle. You think, see, he's like, I think you should. But I'm gonna give him that one more minute. Because they worked hard. You, you, I'm sure you paid, somebody paid something for that to happen. So now we got to get in Windows. Of course, if you have Windows, I'm a Mac guy, you know they start doing the thing where it's like, <laughs> Windows, download the brand new Windows 25. <laughs> Don't turn off your computer. <laughs> Just for hands, how many people have Windows here? Everybody? Everybody's Windows, no Macs? Macs not here? Mac, Mac here, we got Mac, we got a Mac here. Y'all wanna use my Mac? <laughs> I wish y'all could see this, hold up. Oh, I did? There we go. Brand, I don't know if it's conversion, but I'm gonna talk about that in a second. First of all, I wanna say thank you. Uh, and I'm saying thank you because of several reasons. One is, I've never been to this country. And so being brought here, uh, it's been, and I don't know if you've heard it before, it's been, uh, in a day, I've been here a day and a half, maybe like a day and a half, it's been life-changing. And when I say life-changing, I'm not talking about like when I have my, my two daughters, that's, that's a different kind of life change. Um, it's a life change in regards to coming from the States, you hear things and you see things, you imagine what you think it is until you get there. And so, I'm not only, I not only want to say thank you, I'm, I'm humbled to be here because I'm in a country that I, I see the pride of the country. Like as soon as I touch down, I, I see the flag in different places. Not only the flag on a pole, but flags going through the, the bridge and it's, and it's on the side of the bridge. And there's a pride here that I'm not even trying, to, I'm not even faking, that is kind of intoxicating. I mean, I've had friends that, I, that, that, that work here and I, and I speak on, you know, friends that live in, um, Nairobi. I have friends that, that, that travel here, that work here, friends from the States that have created a business. And so I mentioned the, the African Creative Agency because uh, a good friend of mine named Colin, who is, leads that agency, he's, 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 he explained to me what it's like to come to a country that you're probably from, which the, the funny thing was that, oh, now we got it. Let's give him a hand. They got it going. Thanks. So yeah, so I'm humble. Um, now we gotta see if this works. Hold on. Or I might just keep on doing it. Whoa. All right. So back to what I was saying before. Um, just humbled to be in a country that most likely my people are from. I don't know because I need to take the ancestry.com and see exactly where I come, where 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 my lineage is. Um, and the sad thing about it in the states you probably heard before is a lot of us don't know, right? We 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 call ourselves American but it stops, it stops somewhere in that slavery period and we don't know, a lot of us, I would say a majority of us don't know where else it goes. Where many of you, you probably know where your family heritage is, or at least you feel like you own it, so that's why I say I'm humble. My name is Mike Fox. Most people say Mick because it's spelled M-I-C. It's Mike. And the joke behind that is once, I, once you know me, then you know me. If a bill collector calls me and says, if someone calls me and says Mick, they're either a bill collector or somebody I don't know. So moving forward, you all know me as Mike Fox. Um, oh, there we go. Let's play catch up. I said I'm humble, right? Yes. Represent, talked about the flag. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm catching up. And this is my name, Mike Fox. Um, and 
the other joke behind this is I prepared this on a Mac, so it's not doing what I wanted to do. It's not as sexy as it's supposed to do, but I'm not dissing Windows, I'm just saying, I'm, I'm, we had this conversation, come on, right? We had this conversation about being a Mac guy, so I'm a Mac guy, so I gotta do what Windows gives, gives me, right? So what's my, who am I? Uh, I, I, I'm this, I was a kid, probably, probably twice your age, many of you, but when I was your age, I went to school for computer science. Now, I was the one that was doing computer science coding at night, but then I also had this thing about DJing, so I DJ parties. I was a DJ at my university. And so between falling asleep coding and DJing, I found a passion. So where did this passion lead me? It led, it led me into being in radio. So I was an MC, as a, known as an MC, a radio personality. I was on a night show. I would do all the things where people would call the radio stations. And then I went into management of it. I became over the radio stations and launched a couple of stations in the US. Now while I was doing radio, and this is, this is the part that's kind of fun. While I was doing radio, at that time, this is like in the 90s, no one was really caring about websites. I built them for my web, I built them for the radio stations myself. So I was doing the same thing I did in college. I do parties and I code, so then I learned how to combine the two, and so I build the websites for the radio station when nobody really cared about it, right? It was still one way direction. After I did the management thing in radio, I said, I'm bored. And so I shifted into the music industry, and I've worked at a couple of lab labels you may know. One is Atlantic Records. Uh, they're home for a lot of artists now. Uh, you know, when I was there with Sean Paul and uh, Fat Joe, and then now it's, I can't even remember the artists that are there, but there are a lot of artists that you probably listen to from the States there. While I was at Atlantic, I did the same thing. I created a website where I wanted the DJs to talk to the consumers. So I went to the CEO at the time, who's actually still there, his name is Craig Kalman. And I said, Craig, I want to build a website, I want to call it Atlantic Street, so that DJs can talk to the consumers through the website. He was like, cool, do it, so I did it. It lasted for like five years. This is when you just went to a website just to get information. Then I, got, then I was like, I got the opportunity to work for another company called Def Jam. I don't know if you know about that company. Um, and at Def Jam I did marketing, and I've worked with a couple of artists, you might not know, Kanye, Ludacris, um, just some random artists, and I did marketing. And I marketed with, now I will tell you a quick story about it and I'll keep it going as fast as I can. With Kanye it was interesting because at this time he just came out with, I can't remember the one, the one with the bear, it was like his second or third album. And he was the only artist that I could not put a marketing plan together. Like, you know how you think, like, you know you, you, you can do it? So I, I went to Gye, I was like, yo, this is how I want the art, the, I want the uh, da -da -da to come out, and, I said, da -da -da, and he was like, yeah. Just like he is, he came back and I actually learned from him. So there's also a lesson to learn that if you think you know, you probably don't know because it's somebody who knows better, and you take it and you, you take that in. But worked at Def Jam. Same thing, at that time there was ringtone, so I was big on how do I turn technology into that? What's the media that, I can, that we can use and think of a different way to do it? After that I went to this smaller label called TBT Records, it was an independent label, and I worked with an artist before he became who he is. Um, his name is Pitbull. Um, <laughs> nah, when I met with Pitbull, seriously, when I worked with Pitbull, the budget for the last video I did with him was 11, well, 11 US thousand, 11,000 dollars US. That was before, but that was the album before he became who he is, and he's still the same person. But, I also worked with an artist named Lil Jon. And at this time, MySpace was popping. And once again, I went to MySpace and was like, yo, we shot this video called, um, what was that video, it was like Crazy Colors. Uh, snap your fingers, snap your fingers, yeah. It was a video in the, like 2005 or six or seven, and it snapped your fingers, and I went to him, I said, yo, let's shoot, while you're shooting the video, I'm gonna grab my camera like that, and I'm going to edit it on the spot, and we're gonna upload it into MySpace two hours after you finish doing your shoot. Once again, it became that thing of, how do I take media and tie it into what I wanna do now, 
which at that time I was marketing an artist, but I was like, beyond just being a marketing person, I was like, I want to combine all this together. So that's what I did to the labels. That company went bankrupt, and that's a whole nother story. But when it went bankrupt, I was at that place where I was like, okay, what do I want to do now? So then I had an opportunity to go to another company. And this was interesting because before this company existed, they didn't have a name. So I went to a company called Universal Music Group. And in that group, which owns a lot of big labels and artists and all those types of things, we got the call to create a new platform called, well, it wasn't called this at first. It was just called create a platform to put music videos on. And how do we monetize it? So I'm in my perfect space now because I'm at a place where I can take music and technology. Social media hadn't kicked off yet. Twitter was there. Facebook was still a college thing. Not a lot of users, just on college. And I think that's it. So at this company, after we, it was 12 of us, we launched it. The, the, my, my claim to fame is this is, what are we gonna call it? So I had a small team and we had a list of like 20 different names and this one popped out. And I said, let's call it Vivo. And then somebody else has some crazy name. They wanna call it music, something, something, something. I was like, no, no, no. It needs to be called Vivo. And they were like, well, what's Vivo? And I was like, it isn't. What was Google before Google? <laughs> what, was, what was, yeah, right, right? What was Google before Google? What was Yahoo before Yahoo? Let's do Vivo. Let's create something that's not there. That's what you're trying to do in your life or whatever you're trying to do. How do you create something that's not there? When you're able to put your fingerprint on something like that, that's, that's you've done something. It doesn't have to be some anonymous name. So Vivo never had a, it wasn't an acronym for anything. It was literally, I said, Vivo, two, two syllables, sounds cool, let's do it. Now the joke behind that is once we named it, they were like, go get the domain name, go get the Vivo.com. And I was like, right. So I had to negotiate that. Guy tried to get over, he tried to maybe pay $150,000. I told him I was an intern, I don't know what the name means, whatever. I knocked down the price. He had a good Christmas. He didn't get the 150,000, but he had a nice Christmas. I didn't tell him what the company was. And then six months later, no, nine months later, we sent a big global press release, Vivo. He had a partner who probably buried him somewhere. <laughs> Because his partner didn't want to sell, but it was Christmas holidays. He probably was like, I can get paid. After Vivo, I um, spent four years there. I actually have an, a Vivo alumni here. Where you at? Where's the Vivo alumni? Somewhere. Did she leave? Hmm. I'll find you. I'll find you. Uh, I took a, a quick stamp, and I didn't have that on the thing, but I went to a company called Music Choice. Music Choice in the U.S. handles 50 radio stations on cable systems and I spent two years there after Vivo and it helped me learn the cable business in the industry. And then just recently I now at a company called Emmis. Emmis in New York City owns uh, a radio station called Hot 97. Um, I am over all digital for Hot 97. We have a sister station called WBLS which is a very urban, is a adult urban radio station. It's been there for I don't know 40 years. It was one of the first by the first, the first group of black-owned radio stations in the country um, has since been brought by Emmis. Hot 97 is a brand, right? Um, it's a global brand for us because we basically set the tone for what's happening in the U.S. in regards to what we're doing. Uh, this was a concert we did last week. It was called On the Reggae Soca, On the Soca Reggae Tip. We do a lot of big, big events. We do something called Summer Jam, which is 50,000 people in New York City. It's a big concert in the summer. We do this concert in August. We have another concert in, in uh, December, and it just keeps going. And I got to get, and literally while I was sitting here, I'm sitting there. We're doing a press release. We're actually doing Hot 97 in Tokyo on November 11th. And so. This also goes back to the point of why I'm here, right? Um, I'm here because I'm here to talk about the convergence of media and platform. And what does that mean to you? Well, 
the convergence of media and platform is I don't look at social media as social media anymore. I don't look at cable as just cable anymore. I don't look at radio as radio anymore. I lost my screen here, so I have to look up here. So here's what happened. In the 90s, it was radio, TV, and internet. None of them talked to each other, right? Internet was the internet. You went to the internet, you watched, you watched, you just went to a web page. When you're on TV, you just watch TV. When you're on radio, you listen to radio. You might have the radio on, you might have said TV, ask your parents. They had the one, it was one or the other, if you're that young. If you're older, you know what I'm talking about. Then what happened? Early 90s, the phone popped up, right? But it wasn't like the phone you talked to. It was this phone. I'm sorry, I'm a Mac boy, I told you that. It's probably another phone, Samsung, I'm not dissing Samsung or LG or any of those, but I'm a Mac person. But this phone pretty much set the precedence of where we're going to, right? Why? Because when this phone came out, what did it do? It wasn't just to talk, it was to what? It connected everything together. It said, you know what? I'm gonna take the internet, put it on the phone, and so now you're looking at the internet on your phone, but you still got radio you listen to, and you got TV you're listening to, you're watching. But then came this thing, social media. Remember when I said like Twitter started in 2006 or seven? Then all of a sudden, it was YouTube. But YouTube was just a platform to play videos. Facebook was, uh, when it first started, if you don't know, was just a platform for guys in college to check up on girls and vote. That's all it was. If you don't know the story about Facebook, that's what it was. They would put a girl or a guy and basically vote on that person to say, hot or not. That's really what Facebook was about. Then, what happened after that? What are we talking about? What's now? You had social media, you had TV, you had radio, and where we are now is a whole different place. Right at the end of my presentation, everything starts working. We got this 360 thing that's happening. We're, these are all the platforms, and I put a question mark and I'll explain that in a second. They're all talking to each other, right? On Instagram, it used to be a picture. Now it's video. On YouTube, it just started as a video, but now you can socialize about the video. You can talk about the video. Some of you probably put a video and you got people that basically go in there and say, that's whack, because they don't know how to do it better than you. But that's what they do. But you can start a conversation. So YouTube is not really just a video platform, it's a social media platform to me. Because you're talking, you're having a two-way conversation. Instagram now, with stories, IG stories, and then you can flip it and you've got video, it's not just a social media platform, it's actually like a cable system. Because I have a 12-year-old, and all she does is this all night. That's her cable. She doesn't watch cable as people used to watch cable. She watches Instagram and watches all the content. Social media is media now. It's all the same, so that's why I'm here. I'm talking about the convergence of media and how you can no longer just look at it for what it is. It contains everything. You don't need to be a billion dollar company to create a company. It's kind of like what I said before. The content is king and what you do to create it is the most important thing. And as you create it, you gotta know the audience that you're talking to. The key to this and what I do all day with my team in New York is how do we talk to the audience that is our audience and how do we communicate that? And so the key to all of this, when I say the convergence of media, Twitter, same thing. Twitter, you can do video. Snapchat, Snapchat is video live, but it doesn't have the analytics yet. Kind of pisses me off, because I want to know who I'm talking to, but you got to figure it out. They haven't figured it out, but they're still making what they got to do. But the convergence of media and platforms is all pretty much the same to me. I don't look at, you know, I've been in every kind of media that you can imagine from TV to radio, I deal with social media, I create video, and now the platform is level. So if you've ever tried to say, I can't do something within that span, this is a different ball game. How many people probably know somebody that has like 100, 250, or 500,000, 50,000 followers? You are now your own walking media company. You don't need, I mean it always helps, but you don't need anything to start because the platform is level. 
So my whole perspective of media is now what I call the convergence. I don't look at social media any different than I look at a cable system or radio because on your phone you can stream a radio station. A radio station can, you can talk and say I don't like this song. On YouTube, like I said, you can have the conversation back and forth. It really comes down to media is king. I forgot, I was supposed to click something. I don't know if it's gonna work the way I wanted it to work. Right, I said platforms. They're supposed to shift into media, right? And so that's where we are. And I think this is what this conversation is about. How do we take what we have, what you're doing, and make it transcend and talk to the audience that you need to talk to? And that's all we do at every level all day. The beauty of that, and it's funny because I had this conversation with the head of Emerson New York on YouTube, and I said, you know, we we make a good amount of money with what we do. Um, if you're not familiar with some of the talent that comes out of Hot 97, if you listen to beats music, we have Ebro, Old Man Ebro, we have Funk Flex, we, and we have so many artists that come through. And so we have an advantage where the content we create, and I mean, it's every day we have an artist there. I was just telling, <laughs> I was just telling my man, I was like, Tiana Teller was doing in about two hours and I'm here in Africa today. I was like, I missed that one. Um, but even with the content we create, I go on YouTube and I see people that are literally using their iPhone creating content that's spinning up a million views a day. And if you don't know how that money works out, a million views a day, or two, let's say two million, two million views a day divided by a thousand puts you at what, 20,000? Times a CPM of average $11, do the math. That's how much money people are making off of that off of just creating content. Thus, they don't need the networks. I don't know the different media companies here yet. I'm still downloading myself about all of the different talent that's here, but the convergence of media is where this is at. So I don't know where, like, I know we're gonna start the panel. I just wanted to like present where I'm from. First, just being humbled to be here. I'm here to answer questions. I know we're gonna have a bigger discussion. More than anything, I want you to look at what you do and how you touch if you're on the back end of communicating to someone in the media world or if you're a brand or you just might be someone who's just trying to figure it out because that's why you're here. You're trying to figure out like how can I do what I do? Do I love what I do? How do I, there's two things you can try to do. Some people, the end result is can you make a life out of it? And there's so many people that are making lives out of it because they don't look at things as just separate they look at it like a media company i'm my walking media company you are your walking media company when you socialize with what you do to your friends you are a walking media company it's just that there have been other people who've done it better they've just said you know what i'm going to do this but i'm going to monetize this and i'm going to make money off of this and i'm going to integrate this with a brand and so they don't look at it no longer like social media they look at it as media. So if there's anything to learn from what I've just said, don't look at, I know it's social media week, but it really is just, what? Media week. So look at it from that perspective, and I think that can change the way you think and what you do and how you do business and what you do on your own, because that's the key. Um, that's like my presentation of who I am, what I do, I'm clearly, I think we're going to spin into a sort of a QA, and a if I'm correct. Are there other speakers involved? Or, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so I took up too much time. Thank you. I know we're going to have some, so I don't know who's up next, but I'll pass the buck. All right, and ladies and gentlemen. So um, coming up next, we have uh, Gary Al Smith. Um, I'm sure most of you uh, know him to be a sports journalist. He has been uh, around the world, uh, BBC, CNN, a whole lot. I, I won't take that from him. So um, let's do it for him. Let's give him a round of applause. Gary Al Smith, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, right. Is this how I should look? <laughs> All right. Good afternoon. Grateful to be here um, testing. I'll need it. I'll need it. Are we good? New screen. So good afternoon everybody. Um, very packed session as usual. I'm not sure 
how Echo House is able to pack every event like that. I mean, there has to be something in the water they give all of you. Yeah, give it up for Echo House, please. Um, so while everything loads, Echo House, while we're all starting out as, say, young people who wanted to do something with their lives, uh, somewhere in 2005, I completed senior high school. I did science, what we call general science. I'm in Presec, I passed quite well. And then I was at home, I was at my dad's office because he said, well, when he left me at home, by 13, I was 12, 13, I was quite responsible so I could take care of the house. But he realized that his failure to get me a video game, which I'd been asking for since I was 10, was becoming a problem because I was frequenting the area video game zone and I wasn't coming home on time. So dad will leave home around 7.30 here and my mom. And then, um, you know, I'll be doing everything by the time they, they left home. Immediately they got out of the house. I'll probably literally count up to like 300 seconds. <laughs> then if I had dishes to do, I'll leave the dishes there. And by the time they came back at 5.30, everything will be the way they left it. So he was asking, why are you going? I'm like, oh, I'm playing with friends. He wanted to know which friends, but of course I wouldn't tell him. Then he got to know that I was frequenting the game centers around, and then he decided that it's a waste of my time. So he'd rather take me to his office, to intern at his office. What kind of internship? Basically learn office jobs. I mean, how to, so I was his PA, basically. But I wasn't liking it, it was boring. He had a friend who was a publisher at the time. He was starting his newspaper. And then um, he came to drop a few copies at the front desk. So I picked up the copies. I've always liked sports, but it was never an ambition to become a sports journalist. I was on the editorial board in school, so writing has always been something I wanted to do. But I just decided, look, if I had to choose between being with my dad in his office and going to this place, I'd rather go to this place. So I told my dad, you know what? It's a win-win. I won't bother you. I won't have a frown face the whole day. Your clients will not ask why this your son is frowning at them. So let me go. He said, well, here, yeah, go. What he didn't anticipate was that I loved it so much in the first month. After the first month, I came and said that, I know I've done science. I know I've passed well. I don't want to do any science again. I want to be a journalist. So, Long story short, we had a very big fight um, because he had spent considerably, considerable amounts of money to, for, you know, per sec, I mean, in the science education. Um, he spent quite a lot. And I, even, eventually I left the house. We will go on to make sure we win the game. Um, so eventually I left home at 17 because I had a fight with my dad. Um, but two years later, we patched up because two years later, he started seeing my stuff in the national newspapers. And then the day he called me was the day I had my first appearance on BBC at 19. So I said, well, are you going to apologize or not? And we had a laugh and we patched up. But it was a difficult two years between them because I was hustling, man. Dad wasn't giving me money, you know. But I really needed to prove a point that I wanted to do what I want to do. And at the end of this presentation, that is the hope I want to give all of you. Social media is a, it's a difficult space. We, we are one, one, I don't know, help me, one one million of the potential. You saw the, the question mark he had there. We have no idea where social media is going, and this is true. It's really media week, and I'm glad they gave me this presentation because it really is the future of media, and that is where I'd like to begin. So before we check out this video, the first... Um, slide on the presentation has an introduction about me. So let's go to the PowerPoint and have a look at that before we see this video. And then that's for a reason. But I work in, in here in Accra with the multimedia group, Joy FM um, in particular. I joined them in 2015 from City FM which is a very like hot 97 urban youth oriented but I left CTFM because I wanted to grow up and I'll explain that in a bit so nobody misquotes me um, next slide 
Yes. So that's forward. Down. Right. All right. So this is he. My name is Gary Al Smith. My dad gave me English names throughout. It's something I didn't like when I was growing up, but um, by the time I was 20, I realized how important it was in terms of being a, an advantage for me. I wanted to go into the international space, and there is such a thing as they look at your name before they give you stuff, believe me. So I used to be using my local names, but by the age of 20, I decided that Gary was fine. <laughs> and it's helped me a lot. Whether I'm going to give my kids English names is another matter. It's something I've been thinking about. So I do sports journalism mostly, but because of my education in science and especially because I loved physics, I found myself tinkering with stuff a lot. And the sports journalism I do it, it's a bit experimental all the time. Um, for the international media, I do a lot of digital stuff and multimedia content, including super sport, Kwesi, CNN, BBC, Al Jazeera, New York Times, The Guardian, and a few others. So, thing is, he has saved me 15 minutes, thank you very much, because he's given the preamble of what I have wanted to spend his first seven minutes or so of my presentation. There's absolutely no need to reinvent the wheel. Please play the video, and then we can begin from there. I hope you enjoy the presentation. So, media as it is right now, it started from a space where it was just radio tv they were all monolithic blocks now it's a space where it is converged and it is a space where i think that yeah, yeah like you said the, the supporters is going to be very hostile and we're ready for that we we have a few experienced players who can who can make sure the team stays calm no matter what happens well, let's talk now to the Ghanaian football writer and broadcaster, Gary Alsmith. Gary, always great to have you on. A lot of big uh, big teams in Africa struggling to make it to Russia, including, of course, your very own Ghana, uh, who've been uh, staples at the last three World Cups. What's gone wrong in Ghana, and how surprised have you been by your team's performance? Well, um, the law of averages suggests that this Ghana team should be peaking by now. However, due to political interference and largely um, issues that have to do with players, egos, and also a bit of internal wrangling have contributed to this. In Ghana, there's been a change of government and both political parties have been playing politics, really, with their, with their, with their senior right, national so team can, and it's reflected in their performance, unfortunately. Gary, it's not just go Right, so this is what make Mike, I was listening. Yeah, Mike was talking about. It's a convergence. So you saw the video of a camera taking the shot of a, of a football player in the traditional sense, him talking, and then they come in to have an analysis, not with someone in studio, but somebody on the other part of the world to inform their global audience. And that is where we are in terms of the future of media. They are fusing the monolithic blocks that he spoke about and they've converged it. And it's been all explained in less than one minute. And that's where we are going. The mobile phone you're holding, the, this video camera that's shooting me, they are fitted with all kinds of things that can do these things. And that's the exciting thing. The opportunities are limitless. The earning power, limitless. The challenges, limitless as, as well. And the responsibility for all of us to make sure that this new baby that we have becomes a positive thing is incumbent on all of us. So let's begin the, 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 the next thing. I wanted to speak about, yeah, essentially the same things he spoke about. So I'll run through journalism in the past. So the hypodermic needle theory, anybody in journalism school has studied mass communication. The needle there, it only drops stuff down. Nothing can go back. It's one-way communication. That's what it used to be. Ah, I selected this image because it's Ghana television. We all like to throw GTV. So, and it is the one media institution in Ghana that seems 
even in 2017 to be stuck in the past, you know. So they still have reporters, they still have regional correspondents, they have sub-editors, they actually pay people to just sit down and sub-edit. <laughs> sub-edit, not edit, sub-edits before the main editors. And then they have a cameraman, they have assignment editors, they have desk editors. Then they have engineers and technicians, and they pay all these people. All right. I'm just delivering a lecture. I'm not passing judgment. I know this is going live. People are tweeting this. I don't want any problems with my employers. So this is what it used to be. So the assignment editor, you send a reporter and a cameraman and a district correspondent. They go and get the news from different sources. He spoke about issuing a press release from um, primary, secondary, and tertiary sources of information. And then you write and publish the article, or in their case, they put it on television for you and you watch at the seven o'clock news. The thing about it is that by the time they give you the news, you even know it, and most of the time, you are ahead of them. Uh. Oops. Okay. <coughs> Sorry. Right. So the future of media, I like to look at four main areas. How do the print media or magazine and newspapers, radio and television all look, seek to converge? And what are the opportunities for us? Yesterday, when I moderated the session, you notice I was hammering a lot on the opportunities because I think that is where we should be looking at. It's the age of the internet, like, like uh, Mike said. It's the age of the internet, and it makes all things beautiful in this time, the internet. Now, thing is, the internet can be a monster. All right, can somebody help? How do you do this once? It takes a bit of time. So, I've put two things there. If you look at the top was the, what I like to call for our purposes, the GTV model. Yeah. And also, if you look below, the new kind where the audience get their news from the network of sources and then they post it on their own media. Now, in other words, we are all owning and personalizing our content. He again spoke about the fact that people are sitting down on their mobile phones and creating content that is generating up to and more than a million views. So we have cut out all the unwieldy, big, large systems that are state institutions and that are older brothers, older brethren, brethren in media have been doing and we are becoming more lean. The challenges of becoming more lean are quite obvious. It means then that all the people we listed, engineers, cameramen, technicians, they are going to lose their jobs. But should they be losing their jobs? Should they be losing that? No, they shouldn't. What they have to do is they have to unlearn and then learn. How do they unlearn? Online journalism is the way. Because for every technical engineer, there's content on YouTube, there's content on Google, there's content on PDF Monster, where you can learn how to optimize the same skills that you have, but for a new audience. So you, do, you really don't have to lose your job. It's online journalism. Now, online journalism is wonderful because it forms the bulk of news consumption by the audience, and I'm sure most of us will agree with, with that. These days, when I'm targeting my Facebook posts, I've realized that the difference from last year is, I used to do targeting on Facebook and Twitter for a certain demographic for the content I produce. But increasingly, I am finding people of the ages 45 and up subscribed on Facebook. And so I'm having to target my contents at them. And so I like to challenge everybody who says that, oh, Facebook is for the young and young at heart. It's not true. There's a large group of people who are silent readers. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. There are people who come on Facebook and don't talk. And sometimes we like to say, silent readers, we greet you. And you, they'll respond by liking or you know, retweeting your stuff. So these people, are an audience that we should look at as well. We are producing the content, but there are people that we don't give a lot of attention to. And I, and I like to challenge us as content providers 
as we go into the future of media to look at them as well. Now, traditional news agencies use their online mediums as secondary publishing platforms. What do I mean by that? So you've got your GTVs and Joy FMs and your City FMs and your um, local community radio station who, after putting their content on air, on radio or television, cut that content and then come and put it on social media as secondary content. Increasingly, more and more of us around the world are looking at doing so as a primary content. And there was a young man who just came to pass by here. His name is Kay Fresh. Give us a wave. Yeah. So this is, he works with um, the Joy Newsroom. He's the guy who streams all the Joy News content on Facebook and so on and so forth. So that's him. Now, what they are trying to do increasingly across the media houses is the second point, traditional news agencies using online mediums as secondary publishing platforms. They are trying to do away with that so that we move into the future. Again, Mike made a point about MySpace and Lil John back then where he wanted to produce a music video and then within two hours put it immediately online. And that is visionary. This is when, 2007, right? And it's now become mainstream around the world. That is where we are going to, and it's one of the elements of the future of media. Things will become more real time. By the time you go and press play on that thing you are watching, people would have watched it live online, and that's where we are going. Now, several news organizations are online only. It is a challenge, it's great, it's presenting a lot of opportunities, but there are still threats and there are still issues because we haven't figured how to monetize it properly, and that is the biggest thing. So you've got The Guardian, one of the biggest in the world, still insisting that they don't want to go behind a digital paywall. Why don't they want to do that? I spoke to the online guys at The Guardian probably two weeks ago, and I asked them, well, how is it going with you? I mean, you have some of the other American and British media houses going behind paywalls, and things are not going well for them. So what The Guardian has done is, and I'm sure most of you have seen it, after you read a story, you see a small notification there that says that, give whatever you want. You know, pay as, pay as you like. And it is sustaining them. They say it's not as much as they would like, but it's working for them. Why do they need this money? They need this money because most people who have stopped watching the GTVs of this world, because like he said, his 12 year old now does cable on her, her laptop, iPad, or tablet. Thing is, most of us are consuming this content for free, but this content takes money to produce. Agreed? Yeah. So for you who is enjoying it, Say you are watching your favorite television station and you just log on and you are streaming. It takes them electricity costs, internet streaming costs, bandwidth and all that. How do they pay the guy who is presenting the news on the internet to you? How do they pay the sound engineer, the light guy? So when you pay them this, whatever it is, one Ghana CD, two Ghana CDs, or whatever via PayPal or your credit card, it's a way that they use to pay themselves. That is why some of these organizations are going online only. And as we know, some established traditional brands have gone out of business. They've cut off their, um, it's click and mortar, so they've cut off their physical offices and they've gone only online. And they are trying to make money there as well. And the second thing in the future of media that will rise rapidly, I think, is citizen journalism. Now, all of us here, are journalists in a way. All of us here. You are a journalist and a citizen journalist because if you're on Facebook and you happen to be in a trotro, a bus, or you're watching the television and you're tweeting the event, you're tweeting what you're watching or what whoever is on the medium said. And I didn't watch it, but I come onto your timeline and I come and see it, so I'm informed by you. You are my journalist, aren't you? Yeah, that's how you are my journalist. It is giving rise to social media stars. Those who spend their time watching TV and reporting what they see on TV, or listening to the radio and reporting what they see on radio. We find ourselves going to such people instead of your favorite radio or TV station 
for the news because you've learned to trust them. So if this guy has a habit of putting the newspaper review he saw on TV or radio, the salient points thereof, by seven o'clock, instinctively, you know that, oh, by the time you drop your kids off at school at 6.50 and you miss the news, you go onto his timeline, you are going to get everything. In an earlier session, I wasn't here, but I was following on social media, on, on Twitter, Agent Philemon, um, at Agent Philemon, he was teaching about the basics of Twitter and he was saying that trust is an essential commodity. So even as we are here, we are going into the future of media. Yesterday we touched upon this, but trust is a huge issue when you want to be a citizen journalist. You build your tribe, you become that journalist, you have to abide by almost the same rules that I, as somebody who went to journalism school for two whole years of my life, which now I think is a waste of time, but well, I probably needed that certificate, so yeah, it's all right. So you, I didn't, right. So citizen journalism is another way in which the future of media is coming at us. Yeah, so what are going to be the media of the future? Bear in mind that we've spoken about the media of the past that were monolithic. He explained them brilliantly, so I'll go there. Now, the future will be user-generated reports through blogs, podcasts, and videos. So some of you here, that I don't know by name, but I know by your handles because I listen to your content and I love your content and I subscribe to your content already. I'm not going to my favorite radio or TV station but you here are my social media, you are my news star. I don't need to have gone to journalism school because you do it well, you know your stuff and you are giving me what I want. Now, all these things are going to be having, they have to be supported by something. They have to sit on a platform. So Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and all that are going to grow bigger. There are new ones that are coming in. What are they going to do differently? They are just going to find the, the chinks in the existing armor of Facebook, Twitter, and try and fill those spaces. And you can become a social media star in those spaces as well. So I finish up in the future of media. Journalism becomes blurred because immediately you, you want to become part of the future of media, you would have to become a journalist of sorts at a point. You will learn the ethics of journalism, even if you don't know you are learning them. What are the ethics of journalism? Trust, you cultivate sources, you give exclusive information, and then you provide additional detail. Essentially, you do what a professional journalist like me, I'll be doing, educate, inform, entertain. There's a fourth one I'll touch on before I'm done. So the future of journalism will see everyone create and consume the news, which I've explained. It will be an age of personalization. You have your own news media house because again, like Mike said, immediately you start getting 200, 300, 500, 1,000 followers, your media house on your own. And you have to explore monetizing it as well. So how will news be gathered in the, med in the media of tomorrow? So the information divide essentially is, is um, just as the name implies, the divide between those who have the information and those who don't. That gap is going to close because all of us will become journalists. But the thing about this is that if you want to be part of the media of tomorrow, breaking the news is not enough. I can't say this enough times. Breaking the news at speed is not enough. You have to be accurate as well. Otherwise, you are going to lose, lose your trust and your credibility. So the occurrence of an event has to be at the same time, has to be accurate, has to be as well done when you publish the story or when you put out the report just as a journalist will do. Now, the media of tomorrow is going to be shaped by you and I, as I've explained. So, what business model can we be looking at? Look at the first point. The revenue decreases in media with broad coverage. Simply put, the bigger the media house is, 
the greater the potential for them not to make money in the future media organizations. Why do I say so? If you sit here and you have your one million followers, that is one million followers you are taking from the traditional media. Agreed? Agreed? Good. So just before I came here for the purposes of this discussion, one airline sent me a text that he wanted to speak. I went this way and he said he's the marketing manager. They are having a program on a rival television station of mine. I work with Joy News. But they are going to have a program on a rival TV station. And they want me to use my social media to advertise for them. So now, I've not found the answer to this question. I've not gone to my pastor. <laughs> I've not gone to my mentor. I want to ask you. I work for Joy News. You see, I shouldn't. I, I can't do that. All right. Mike, you are, you, are, you are the expert on this. Please join me here. So I'm saying an airline is going to have a product. It, they're going to sponsor a television program that's going to air on a rival TV station from mine. And they want me to use my, because they know that I have visibility. Should I or should I not take it? Well, I'm asking you. <laughs> so he's asking what is the risk? What is your risk? Yeah. Right. So it raises ethical issues. Yeah, I'm listening. I, you can't hear her, but I'll, I'll just uh, parrot what she says. She says, if I use my platform, I'll be directing traffic to that other media house. True or false? True. But the other thing is that I spent my own brand time to build my social media capital. Yeah. you use to promote your own whatever you're doing? When you were employing me, Join News did not employ my social media space as well, did they? Tell me you are right. No? No? And it's a huge issue around the world. So if you notice, immediately the BBC employ you, if you are at a certain level, they ask you not to use your own social media accounts. They'll provide you one. And you are going to start from zero. Or if you work for a good agency and I have 170,000 followers and I'm going to work for his his media agent for his his media house, he's going to get me as Gary L. Smith, uh. my human being, and then he's going to pay me to not do what this airline is doing. That's where we are going. So I, I, what, the reason why I asked him what his risk was, because yeah. we deal, I deal with this all the time, where you have talent. We have a high 97, we have 1.6 million Facebook followers, I don't know, a million, almost a million Twitter, and that becomes a question because yeah. you built your own. Yeah. So when I said what was the risk, I tend to go, if you are a talent or a personality or a media person, there is going to be a, come a point, what you want to do is get to the point where that's not a question, yeah. because you created something so big that your company that you work for will come to you and be like, well, what do you want to do? Yeah. Because you should be able to get paid for it. Now, ethically, we can get in, if you work for a company, you go, I don't want that person to do something for a competitor. Yeah. But... To his point, why, we, why I said you are your own walking media company, it's because you can get to the point where clients will come to you and go, we will pay you, not the middleman, not your company, not the competitor, you. So it is a great space. I'm not discounting because you're looking at it from a standpoint of, no, you built this on top of the company. Yeah. Oh, well, maybe I'm miscorrect. Okay, I, I think we are going to go into this in detail, <laughs> but this is just a teaser of where we are going. And yesterday somebody asked me, should I start now, please? Start, don't worry, start with one follower, two followers, but there's going to come a time in the world where even if you are not a media person, you are not a journalist, because you have built your brand in your own space, people are going to have to pay you. The biggest example and the trailblazer in this space is Christiana Mampo. She works for CNN, but she works for ABC as well. In 10 years ago, like it wouldn't have even been, they wouldn't even have thought of it. Yeah, it's like for us, we had Ebro who works for Hot 97, but then he's on Beats 1. But he's on Beats 1 as well. And he has, and then we, 
go hit me and go, hey, can you sh can you share this Apple Music? I literally had it last week where Ebro hit me and wanted me to promote content that he created for Apple Music in Paris. And we were like, fine, because we look at it from a standpoint of, and this is why I was saying what I was saying, we win if the talent wins. We win if the media wins. So the company yeah. that I work for now doesn't look at it as competitor as long as it helps build our brand. Yeah, so that's where we are going. The future of media is going to be dictated by all of us here. It's very, very important because yesterday, for those who attended my ses the session I moderated, I ended by saying that, for example, now I work for DSTV, right? Who were my main employers for five years, but now I have stopped working for them mainstream and I'm just doing part work for them and I'm working full time for their competitors as well. But DSTV can't say I shouldn't work for them because if I win, they win, like he says. So please spend time building your brand because in the future of media, all these rules about, I work for this radio station, they are going to go out of the window and you are going to be kin. So, um, that is it for the presentation. These are all things that he has spoken about. And um, as we go on, please remember, the future of media is now. Start building your base from today. It takes time to build trust and wait on social media, but it is worth it. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure being here. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Okay. All right. So, so um, I'm sure most of you have a lot of questions, so you can gather your questions after um, our next speaker is done, then we can um, throw it up to the audience, then you can ask your questions. Now, I understand at 6 p.m., uh, we have women's mentorship session at Vodafone headquarters. So, um, if you want to join, it's for women, actually, for females. So, if you want to join, a bus will be um, commuting you guys to the place. So, um, you can call this number or text this number. Call or text 020-323-5822. 020-323-5822. Or, you can see the receptionist at the front desk there. And then, um, they will direct you to the bus and all of that. Okay, uh, thank you so much, uh, Gary. Can we give it up to him once again? That was an amazing presentation. Moving on to our next speaker. Um, he is in the name of uh, Frank Bruce. Frank Bruce. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give it up for Mr. Frank Bruce. I think uh, back up. Yeah. Back up, yes. All right. Hello, everybody. Um, good evening to you all, and um, thanks for inviting me to Social Media Week. All right, so, <laughs> yeah, um, this is how I talk, so I'm proud of my voice, yeah. But I'm sure you hear me wherever you sit, so, yeah, let's go on. <laughs> okay, so, um, like he rightly introduced me, my name is Frank Bruce. Um, I full time I manage social media for Odikro. Um, Odikro is a civil society organization that monitors the work of parliament and I report to Ghanaians on how to make informed choices about their MPs. And also we 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 put you know your MP in touch with you know all of you so you know what they are doing with your money and your votes in, in the in the chambers of parliament. And um, so I cut my teeth into journalism. Well, I mean, I am a citizen journalist. Um, Gary has said, um, who citizen journalist? Um, who a citizen journalist is? So I cut my teeth in journalism at um, GBC um, on Unique FM uh, on the children's program Curious Minds. So um, Curious Minds is um, for young people. You know, where issues of adolescent sexual and reproductive health and rights are discussed. And um, advice, you know, is given out to the listeners, you know, of the radio station and the program. And then I move on to um, Radio Universe um, while I was in the university. Um, so I, I didn't read, I didn't read um, journalism, you know, in my college years. I read banking and finance, but I have this passion for journalism and storytelling. And so 
um, I had to, you know, volunteer for Radio Universe and I report, you know, stories that happen on campus on the radio station. Yeah, and then, um, so I worked in banking for a year and then I, I left, you know, to pursue, you know, a life in storytelling, you know, using social media mainly. And so um, I'm going to talk about the future of news media in general and um, I will start my presentation with a, a brief history about how um, the media started so um, can we get the slides you know rolled up quickly all right while we wait for the slide to show on the screen uh, let me just speak briefly about so the media started you know, some 30,000 years ago. Um, that's when we started documenting events you know, that happened around us. And this was done you know, by cave people you know, in, in, in ancient times, the Stone Age era, where they scribbled you know, happenings that you know, went by them. Uh, okay, so yeah, like I said, um, media storage and transmission began some 30,000 years ago, you know, um, with cavemen who wrote stuff, you know, on the walls and uh, to document events that happened in their lives. And from then on, we moved to, you know, newspapers, you know, in the, in the, in the year, 1640s so um, before that we started with the Gutenberg press where you know Gutenberg you know published his first um, um, made, made available his first publication you know to the public okay and then um, 19, uh, 1666 the first um, commercial newspaper was launched and then published in the UK um, by the London Gazette, and so um, from there on, um, we've had you know other mediums come pass by. So we've we've had radio, we have television, and now we have the internet. Okay, and um, the internet is 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 very broad. It's an amazing platform where both legacy media, being traditional like radio and television are using to this day to you know um, transmit information you know to us all and um, the internet has also given us the power to create content and distribute same you know to um, everybody you know who we, we interact with daily okay um, slice stop all right so um the future what's the future of media um i'll say the future of media is mobile because all of us i mean we we, we have this small device in our pockets that we document events around us with and um could be text could be video could be photos and um, these are all you know, content that people are interested, you know, to, to read or the people are interested to follow and, and um, make their lives choices, you know, with. And um, video, you know, will be one of the most consumed um, forms of media publications in, 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 in the years ahead of us. And, um, Facebook estimates that um, we, sp I mean, we, we, we spend a lot of time consuming um, videos. Um, um, what's up with the slide, please? <laughs> All right, okay. Okay, so. All right, so um, according to Facebook, um, 
We spend an average of 100 million hours you know, consuming videos every day. And 85, approximately 85% of um, content consumers on the platform live outside the US and Canada. Okay, and uh, it, it means that even here in Africa, um, there are a lot of us who, you know, churn out content on the platform on a daily basis. Could be by live videos or um, videos that have already been shot and, and uploaded onto the platform. And video is, is a very big um, activity these days. Um, we have the likes of Instagram Stories, you know, Snapchat Discover, uh, Facebook Live Periscope, you know, and even YouTube, you know, hosting like tons of video content on these platforms. And they go to tell stories of um, how we live in our lives and what we are seeing outside, when we step outside with our smartphones or with our digital cameras. And um, it goes to tell you that video is really huge because um, we, 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 are, we are moved easily you know, by watching videos. Um, we, we are visual human beings and um, if you want to make a point, especially on social media, the best way to do it is through video because then you, 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 you tend to you know, gather a lot of eyeballs onto what you are trying to you know, send out there. Okay, and so um, individuals, news organizations, you know, business entities are using video a lot in, in their campaigns. Okay, and um, if, you are, if you are somebody who has you know, clout on social media and you heavily capitalize on creating and distributing videos, you can make a lot of um, Money, all there are quick op opportunities, you know, with video, because um, the the better your video on social media, the more likely that um, you are contacted by an entity, you know, to produce or to to promote their campaign on your platform, okay, by video. And so, um, uh, well, so like I said, the future of um, media is mobile because we all, you know, possess mobile devices and we create content every day. Even as we're here, I mean, we are, we are live tweeting this event and it's content and we are doing this from our mobile phones. Some are using their computers, you know, to, to send information about events that are happening around them. Um, the videos that people also upload to these platforms. And um, um, the statistics above me is from the recently released Ghana Social Media Report, that's 2016. And it estimates that um, well, the average Ghanaian now spends three hours and 30 minutes consuming online content. No, by mobile, and um, about 350 minutes or so is spent on social media platforms. Three, three hours and 30 minutes is spent on the social media platforms. It means that um, we spend a lot of time on social media. In fact, um, with our mobile phones, you know, distributing content or creating content, you know, for our followers to um, to 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 make their, their you know, choices you know, based on the information that we churn out. Okay, three minutes, all right. Um, let me see if I can wrap up. All right, so um, social media has um, created you know, digital native platforms. You know, we've, we have um, AJ Plus, we have now this news, Mashable Bass Feed, even Pulse Ghana, which you know are heavy on videos because they know that you know news or they, they know that their audience you know is they, they rely on video to you know to, to make their, their decisions and so these organizations you know churn out contents 
that are heavy on videos and they, they make they make sure that because of the attention span of every social media user you know to be very very you know minuscule like about seven seconds so they they make sure they they cut they, they cut you know they 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 make sure the if if they, they, they're going to produce a content that will take an hour you know to watch they make sure they reduce the size of whatever they, they, they intend to communicate to the public to as as small as three minutes or could be a second or maybe 10 seconds and these are I mean these 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 information are so deaf that you know you you easily you know are informed when such information is put out there on video okay and so the future I mean again I mean we, we should we should not stop you know con I mean churning out content okay we should keep at it because th this is where the world is going and um, there'll be a time no, no, nobody you know, would, would switch on the television or the radio although I mean, we still we still have you know huge numbers you know listening to radio these days in Africa especially but um, there'll be a time you know news information and even advertorials will not be broadcast on legacy media but um, digital media will rule in other world okay yeah um the, the, <coughs> there's this video i want to show you um it's, it's from Egypt plus uh, just just to you know in effect show you how you know information is is distributed in a very small length of time okay so um if we can go ahead and then watch the video all right so th this this is an explainer of you know um, a recent event that happened in the United States where um, the government you know repealed an act you know for that that seeks to encourage um, immigrants into their country you know to live and, and basically build their dreams in the United States so let's go ahead and watch this video and I'll be here to you know answer questions all right my family, it's, it's 11 million people in this country, it's 800,000 DACA students and DACA recipients. It's a part of our country that's really suffering and that, that many aren't standing up for. We've had a history of concentration camps, we've had a history of enslavement, and now we have a history of immigrants being treated wrongly and, and, and also, you know, children brought to this country possibly being deported. And and um, it's a terrifying thought. All right. Amazing. The hashtag is SMWI Accra. Join, join the hashtag we trend in social media week. Um, so now it's time for questions. If you have any questions, okay. We will take three questions from the audience. Uh, if you have a question for Gary, for Mike, and then for Mr. Frank. Okay, so we do it with the first lady. Okay, my name is Akosia. I'm still unsettled about the Gary scenario. I'm wondering whether we, whether you can draw a distinction between offering your expertise in an area and then using your brand to promote that of a competitor. So let's say Gary is is an awesome sports journalist. So TV3 has a sports program and they want his expertise. He can join the panel and discuss it. But when now he has to use his platform that he would use ordinarily to promote his show on a rival station to promote something that is going to air on a competitor station. That's where my my difficulty is that's why I'm trying to see if we can draw the line between just offering your expertise in a particular area that everybody knows that you're the authority on and that when they see you there they can respect that you're there because you are the person that needs to speak on it rather than using 
what people know you to be telling people that go and watch this show on another station when I know that you're on this station. It's like, if it's so good, why are you not there? So I'm just trying to understand. So no, 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 I, I, I think it, it's two things, right? I think it goes back to how his business, oh, how he's prepared his companies and his business to address the person that he is, okay? I do believe that the average person that looks, that watches Gary, that watches other brands, here's, here's, here's the deal. We're all smart now. We don't care. I don't care what I'm looking at, where I'm looking at from a business. They don't care. People don't care no more. They just want to know, is, is he someone that I can trust? And I follow Gary because Gary is at all the places he's at. So that's why we were saying we're in this place where it's not about where he's at, it's who he is or, where she, or who she is. Does that make sense? Because I know you're struggling with it from a business perspective. You're looking at it like a, from a competitive, like if, I, if you hired someone to represent your brand, this is, what, this is where you're struggling with. If you hire someone to represent your brand and then your competitor hires that person and you're like, well, I just paid this person that's what my company is right now. We don't look at it that way anymore because we look at people and go, and I'm using Ebro in the morning as an example. Ebro does our morning show in Hot 97. His ratings are very important. Then he goes and does afternoons on Beats One. Apple Beats One. Now in theory, we should not allow him to do that because he can be taking business from our afternoon person that's on Hot 97, right? That's not how we look at it, you know why? Because his brand is part of our brand. We promote Ebro for Hot 97, we promote him on Apple Music because you know what? When he speaks, the, the my, my job is to make you think when he's, when he's speaking on something, Hot 97 comes first. So it's a different business model that's about to happen. It's not about the brand controlling the talent. It's about the brand accentuating the talent and making you think that, what's the first thing I'm gonna think about if I see Gary? That's the job of a brand now. What is the first thing I'm gonna think about when I see Gary? Your job as a business is to be the first thought. Um, very, very quickly, I think that, like I, I, I gave an example of Christiana Mampo, it's, it's happening. So for those who like football, there's a very famous footballer who is now a pundit called Gary Lineker and he cuts across now. Gary, um, for the longest time, has been associated with BBC. Last year, something awkward happened. Um, a rival brand had the rise to the UEFA Champions League, that's BT Sport. And then they came and said, Gary, we want you to come and do the Champions League. He does not do Champions League on BBC. But BBC said, because you do a flagship Premier League show, you can't score. You know what Gary did? He took his contract with them and then said, I'm going to give you, BBC, two million pounds of my contract. Two million pounds, so that I can go to this other place and go and do, but I don't want to stop BBC. I want to do the BBC thing on Sundays and I want to do the Champions League on Tuesdays and Wednesdays and whatnot. Why are you stopping me? So they took his money, they had to redo the contract, and he's there. And I'm saying, that's where we are going with in the media. <laughs> for, for a long time, media houses have determined, or let's say employers, I don't want to, to but employers have determined how we behave. But there is coming a time where, for example, at where we're Joy FM, for those of you who like Open House Party by DJ Black, increasingly, there are many Fridays that you don't hear him. But on his Instagram, he's in the States, he's in the UK, he's, and you keep wondering, so does Joe FM pay him his correct salary at the end of the month? Yes, they would pay. Because he's built his, he's built his brand to such an extent that if you hear him even once a month on Joe FM, he would argue that you benefit as a brand. So. All I want to say is, I brought this scenario just to empower all of us that we can all grow our individual brands. When we get to that place where you have to argue with the employer, we'll, you, we'll cross that bridge when we get there. Yeah. Thank you so much. Okay, next question. This one? 
Hi, my name is Jamila, and I have a YouTube channel, and I focus on travel vlogs. And um, I, my question is, how do you focus and draw audiences from different regions of the world? Both of you are able to work in international, like working internationally, but the target audience is significantly different based on what region of the world you're in. So, world you're in. So my question is how do you maybe change the way you talk or change the way you're perceived to um, maybe cater to both audiences? Uh, you want to take a crack first? Okay. Alright, so she's asking, she says she's a travel blogger. Vlogger. Vlogger. So uh, video blogs and she wants to know how she can make her traffic relevant to people in different regions of the world. Okay, so um, in my experience now, because there's Facebook, there's, Twitter, there's all these social networks, you can do targeting first of all. So if you put out content this time, today, that is relevant to people of Southeast Asia, you just put the content up there and then make sure that you pay or target it's to that audience if you are not doing paid content and it's just organic you might be in trouble because all these networks from youtube to twitter they are becoming smart and if you don't pay to target it's not going to get to your audience so i think off the top of my head that's what you can do another free way you can do that is and this is something that i'm really passionate about collaboration and partnerships that's where the world is going please if you know any other travel vloggers in your space, you are based in, where are you based in? In the US. If you know any other travel vloggers in Africa, in Europe, Southeast Asia, reach out to them and let them repost their stuff. Like form a loose confederation. When they have stuff, you put it on yours. It's a great way and it works all the time and it's free. That's what I'll say. Um, good thing because now I don't have to follow you. You answered it. Um, the key to media, because like I said, I'm taking away the social media, is being authentic. If you're not authentic to traveling, no one's going to believe you. So if you are a true traveler, and it doesn't take a lot of money, like you can be the travel. What is your story? What is your narrative? Let's be clear. He's correct. You can buy your way into showing people. But if you bought your way in and no one believes your story, you've just spent money that's gonna go nowhere. I would rather start with one, two, because the way it works in social media, as many of you know, is exponential. You get one, you get two, two is four, four is eight, eight is 16, and it keeps on going. But you have to be authentic in what you're doing. And let's be clear, just like you said, on Facebook, as of today, I pulled up a stat, Two billion people are on Facebook. Two billion people are on Facebook. On a given day, I think it's something like 130 million people check in in a 24 hour span just on Facebook. That's not Instagram, Snapchat, and all the other platforms. So how do you cut through? That's the other thing. When I say what you being authentic and narrative, you also gotta figure out in your content, and I do this, I have 22 people under me, video, cameras, social, I do the same thing, and it was kind of goes back to that story what I said before, right? I have a team. I have Hot 97 as a brand. I have MS. I have a, a seven-figure budget, and there's this female or male that takes an iPhone and does this and shoots content and gets a million views on YouTube. Why? Because they're authentic, and they've created something that cuts through what I call cuts through the filter. So that's what you gotta do. You gotta figure out what, what your authenticity is. And you also gotta figure out, okay, all these travel blogs that I see, all these people, how can you be different? And then start telling your story. All right. So can we give a round of applause for our speakers? Yes, that's it for this session. We're moving on quickly with the next session as a media trend. Uh, the that's amazing. <laughs> okay, so that's fine. All right. Amazing. <laughs> the media trends, the Ghana case study, that's what is happening now. We're going to do that um, right about now. But to the, next, to the announcement that I made earlier, the women's mentorship session is happening at Vodafone 
Ghana headquarters. So um, if you're here, you're a female, there are a lot of great speakers. We have an, uh, Anita Reskin is going to be there, Patricia Obonai, and a whole lot. So if you want to participate, please, Bass will be commuting those who will be going. So see the receptionist at the front desk, and then you can get to go. All right, so we're moving on to our first uh, speaker for this particular uh, session. She is a lecturer. She's a, a co-founder of Blogging Ghana. Um, she's a writer. And then, ladies and gentlemen, without much ado, let's give it up for Katsa Halbeck Edu. Oh, can we give her a round of applause, ladies and gentlemen? Hello. Good evening. Can we raise our hands if you are a blogger? Are you a blogger? Okay, I'm one. Okay, just behind me. Thank you. Uh, are you on Tumblr? Are you on Twitter? Are you on Instagram? Uh, are you on Snapchat? I'm too old. Um, what else do I want to ask? Want to ask? Are you based in Ghana? Just half. Are you based in Ghana? Are you based in Greater Accra? Are you based in Tama? Okay, speak to me later. Um, do you have more than 500 followers in total? Do you have more than 500 followers on one single place, like Twitter? Do you have 1,000 followers or more? 5,000 followers or more? Okay, I, I just want to see who I'm talking to, because I'm a researcher, right? So I need to, to know my environment. So I'm going to talk about the environment we have here in Ghana um, and my experience of it. I've been a blogger for 10 years in Ghana. Originally I'm from Sweden. But you can hear my last name is Idu. So I've made my way into the Ghanaian society. Um, I would like to call myself the grandmother of social media in Ghana because I'm the co-founder of Blogging Ghana, the first organization for influencers in Ghana. Do we get an applause? So the first time we met was in August of 2008. Uh, we met in a restaurant. Uh, can you guess how many bloggers came to the first meetup? It was more than two. Five. It was more than five. Ten. It was less than ten. Eight. <laughs> okay, so it was eight people showed up. Today, Blogging Ghana has 200 members and counting. Of course, it's not even every blogger that is part of Blogging Ghana. It's just those who are, I don't know, crazy enough to, like you, spend Wednesday afternoons talking about social media in a dark room. Um, I think my kind of main observation about social media in Ghana is one of disappointment. I'm very sorry to be like this, <laughs> but, but social media is a revolution. It means that I have a voice, I can self-publish, I can say something to the world, and it doesn't matter who my parents were, right? It doesn't matter how much money I have in my pocket. I can speak to the world. That's what we're dealing with here. And we're not using it to the fullest. We're talking about how to brand ourselves. We can change the world with this. We can come together. I think that's what we need to do. We need to come together in groups, decide what issues are important, and push them. Right? Yeah. Instead, we're here branding ourselves. Right? Follow me. It's my handle. Oh. Oh. <laughs> the different social media platforms. If you put that dot .com after it, that's my blog. Okay, so we're focusing on the wrong things. How can you amplify the things that you think are important? How can you amplify your own voice? Clap if you know of the following hashtags. Hashtag AfriFem. Hashtag 233 moments. Hashtag Tema00. Okay, I'm working on it. Hashtag uh, Bar Camp Ghana. Hashtag Joll of Boars. Hashtag the one we use here, S-M-W-I Accra. That's a way of coming together, right? That's a way of aggregating content. We should do much more of that. When was the last time you invented a hashtag? Today, which one? 
Insta page. Hits update. Why? Can you just hits updates? But what is it for? Okay, a hashtag for a radio station. Okay, so if you want to help him out, let's use that hashtag, right? That's how it works. Um. Vodafone, power to you.